you should see there are a bunch of agendas on our emails. Um, and I'm just going to start with introducing myself. My name is Erica Faulkner. I use she and her pronouns. I live on Decatur Street, and I'm a Ward 2 steering committee member. Um, do any of the other steering committee members want to raise their hand? Say hi, there's Lauren, Molly. Anyone else? So, um, beyond that, we are seeking a representative for, from Ward 3 for the CDBG program. Um, if you want additional information, you can come talk to any of us after the fact. Um, now, sorry for all the speedy introductions, but I'm trying to catch us back up to where we left off. So, now I'm going to uh, take 10 minutes for the public forum. Does anyone have any announcements or anything they want to say? Um, hi, my name is Keegan, um, and I'm here um, representing Big Heavy World, which is a music nonprofit um, in Burlington. Um, our main focus is inclusivity and um, equal access to the music scene in Burlington. Um, so, something we're currently planning is an event called Make Music Vermont, and that's going to take place in um, June, I think June 21st of next um, summer. And we're looking for a place to host the event at, preferably somewhere outside, um, a large area. So if anyone has any suggestions, that would be great. Um, another thing that we're working on is we're working with a group of youth in our community to develop a youth cultural space um, in Burlington. Um, basically, uh, it's, it would be a place, it would be a music venue and a place that engages the youth within our community um, to get them um, an activity like that. Um, and as we consider redeveloping within Vermont um, or within Burlington, I think that incorporating a place like that would be super beneficial to take into consideration. So I wanted to put that out there. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have. Thank you so much. Thank you. Does anyone else have any announcements? Hi, my name is Sean Molina with the Burlington Lead Program. Uh, how many of you know what the Burlington Lead Program is? Excellent. So, uh, we are, we'll be taking uh, applications uh, starting really in the spring. Um, if you are a renter in Burlington and you see lots of chipping, peeling paint or are worried about lead, um, lead-based paint, which um, we certainly are and are looking to help get rid of, um, you can get in contact with me or look us up on the web. I'll leave some information uh, on the table so you can uh, read more about our program. I just want to take a second to honor Shelby, who was a steering committee member, as many of you probably know, and she recently stepped down, but I want to thank you for your time on the steering committee and your leadership. Hey everybody, I'm Ivan Clipstein, I'm a local artist. Hello, TV man. <laughs> yeah, here in Ward 2, uh, working artist and early education person. I'm just here at the very last moment because some of you may have heard that the raffle tonight is two advanced copies of the Everyday Neighbors Free Multilingual Community Calendar, which will be available uh, at the end of next week. It's going to the print um, in a couple of days. And I'm just here to announce that for the next maybe 12 to 24 hours or so, there's still a few spots available for community orders or small businesses with just crazy ideas. If you want to advertise on any given month, the gray space here, like I'm 
either side of the day's grid. I can sign into local orgs and businesses like the railroads in there, Miss Williams Donuts, and all kinds of other delicious things, roads and farmers market. I have a few spots left, so come and hit me up if you want. They're so cheap, it's only 50 bucks for one little square, and it's going to be 1,000 plus copies of this calendar available free just for people to pick up in piles out there in the neighborhood in the city. So that's the announcement. You don't need to email me or call me, just come see me in my physical form. And it's <laughs> nice to dine with you all. It's a delicious dinner tonight. So we can ask you to just and approve. Thank you so much. So my colleagues have suggested I go first because I am going to set a timer for myself. So there's many things we're going to be working on and, and some uh, priorities for me are what I'm hearing from people which is quote unquote public safety which I think of as something beyond that um, but we'll, we'll get to that and housing and how we need a vision for Vermont. So basically, um, be the pandemic left behind in its wake uh, greater disparities and in inequities, um, which is driving um, violence and negative human behavior. And if we respond to that with more violence, we're gonna perpetuate more violence. We have to respond to that violence, not with state violence, but with community care. And so it's my hope that we will focus our efforts on developing a, a, a vast continuum of housing options from, uh, that are affordable, from the, the least restrictive in the community to the most secure recovery residences for people who pose a risk to themselves or other um, due to mental illness, substance use disorder, or cr our criminal behavior. And that if we commit to this, that we can end incarceration as we know it in Vermont and set an example for the world of how we can hold people accountable by wrapping them in community care. But the first step is that we need housing, desperately. And so I think we all will agree on that. And, and, um, and there's several bills I'm introducing that I can talk about in more detail later. If people wanna hear kind of how I think we should do this, because that would take up more than three minutes. Um, that's halfway through. So um, that being said, as we build this housing around Vermont, the way that we do it is gonna be important. And we have an opportunity to engage communities on the neighborhood level, the city level, and regional level in expanded forms of democracy where we empower people to have more of a say over the decisions of their life because inclusion and belonging is an important social determinant of health. And so as we look to provide and improve uh, for the social determinants of health for people, which include housing, food, health care, education, economic opportunity, social opportunity, we need to be thinking about inclusion and belonging in ways for people who feel like they have been rejected by society to have a path back in. 
and that the answer is not going to be to segregate people or ship them away or lock them up. It's going to be to wrap people in care and services where they're at along the continuum and, and provide endless opportunities for people to recover and to restore the harm that they cause and to feel like they're accepted as neighbors. And so on that note, how do we, what could get us there? What could be a guiding star? I think we should bring the Olympics to Vermont. And we can talk more about the details, but the new model of the Olympics is, is, is perfect for what we need to do, where you, you, you create community assets over the course of time that are used for the Olympics, but, but remain. And, and if we do this the right way, we could be an example of the work for the world of how to, in the 21st century, create a sustainable and equitable way of life on Earth. Good modeling. And hi everyone, I'm Emma mulvaney Sianek. I'm the state representative for Chittenden 17, which runs from Battery Park up into Ethan Allen Park. My two kiddos are over there, so forgive me if they start interrupting. <laughs> but I think they're well taken care of. Um, so I'm also running for mayor right now, so my legislative update's gonna be really focused. Um, I'm trying to be really effective in both spaces, but I'm trying to finish some work I started uh, my first session of this biennium. And that, the, there's three um, bills in particular I'll be trying to push on and make sure we get across the finish line. And here is Elliot, right on cue. Um, the first is uh, normalize having kids and doing big jobs. Um, and so S-102 is the, what we are calling the PRO Act, which is a labor bill. It has passed the Senate, which is very exciting. And hi, Elliot. And the second, he loves microphones, so beware. Do not give him a microphone. Um, but this labor bill is important because there's three aspects of it. It will make the unionizing process easier. It will go from a three-step process to a two-step process for folks who are in the public sector, so public employees. It will ban things called captive audience meetings, where, where employers used to be a labor organizer. So I'll tell you, captive audience meetings happen in Vermont where folks are trying to organize a union and employers allowed to corral people in and talk about how awful the union is and a couple other things. So hoping to get that out of the house and pass the finish line. The second one is a bill that's up on the wall to create a practical support fund from, by the state to allow low-income Vermonters to gain access to abortion health care. This is in response to the Dobbs decision last year. The state of California and Oregon have established practical support funds. I'd like to even add, because I've been talking to folks in those states who've implemented these funds, to add gender-affirming health care access to that fund as well. So that's a bill I'd like to get um, moving this session if possible. And then finally, <clears throat> good old Burlington Charter changes. I feel like I'm just that lab partner who keeps pushing them forward. We have one more left that's still on the wall in the state house, and that's for just cause eviction rights for tenants. Uh, and that would allow the city to start the ordinance development process um, to make sure that it's a transparent process for landlords as well as tenants. Um, and then finally, I think I have a, did I set my timer? Yeah, how embarrassing, I don't think I set my timer. There's a couple of constituent bills because those ideas come best from constituents around um, uh, adding a licensing program for contractors to help protect consumers. And then also in terms of the housing crisis, it's an emergency at this level. Um, there was some really um, brilliant ideas from constituents around leveling the playing field for Vermonters who need financing to buy homes rather than just all cash, which is really pricing people out and a structural barrier for folks. So those are two other little bills, um, trying, not little, but bills trying to put forward. Thanks. Hello, everybody. I am Martine LaRocke-Dulick. I am a state senator here um, in, who lives here in Burlington, and I represent Chittenden Central, along with Senator Vyhovsky, who's next to me, and uh, Senator Baruth, who couldn't be here because he's actually presenting at um, a public safety gathering this evening. Um, but it's nice to see you. Thanks for coming. I think I can take credit for this evening because I really wanted to hear from all of you, so I look forward to hearing what your priorities are and what you're looking for us to do in the coming session. That said, I can tell you a little bit about what I hope to be doing. Um, I am on Senate Education. I'm the vice chair of that committee, and I'm on Senate Health and Welfare. And in Senate Education, I believe that one of our primary focuses this year is going to be literacy. Um, you've probably all been hearing how uh, literacy rates in the state of Vermont are quite dismal, um, especially with um, our young children. It's imperative that students learn to read well by third grade, otherwise they really struggle after that because in third grade you shift from learning how to read to using the ability to read to learn. So 
it's a critical time, so you can probably expect to see some bills coming out of our committee around literacy. Um, I have been working all summer on the school construction aid committee. Um, in 2007, the legislature put a moratorium on school construction aid, <clears throat> which seems like wasn't necessarily the best decision um, because what's happened is we went from giving 30% um, aid to school districts that needed help with their school buildings to nothing. And so we now have this slate of buildings across the state, including, as you know, BHS, that were you know, really falling in disrepair. And it's going to take a lot of effort and a lot of resources to get those to a place where they're healthy, safe, um, and good learning environments for our kids. So that, hopefully, you'll be uh, seeing some, something around that. Um, mental health is obviously going to be a big issue for us. Sadly, we are losing federal funds. Our ESSER and ARPA money is going away. And that money has really helped us provide schools with more mental health pro providers, more um, resources for mental health. So that's, this is going to be a struggle for us, for sure. It's going to be hard. Um, in health and welfare, we had a joint committee this summer that focused on homelessness and housing, and that really set the stage for the work that we're going to do this session. We're going to be focusing a lot upon homelessness and housing. Um, and yeah, I am working on a social work compact bill, which will allow us to have social workers provide services to Vermonters who are in our compact. And I still have two bills from last year. One is a psilocybin bill that I really hope moves um, this year, um, primarily to help mental health professionals um, help folks with PTSD and other um, serious mental health issues. So, and I will pass on to Senator Vyhovsky, but thank you so much. Awesome. So I'm Tanya Vyhovsky. I also represent Chittenden Central in the Senate. Um, I am on the Judiciary Committee and Vice Chair of the Government Operations Committee. Um, in Judiciary, I know some of the priorities for our committee this year are to take a look at what at expungements and what is what crimes are expungeable when and how, as well as um, looking at bail reform. Um, overdose prevention centers to respond to the opioid crisis that we are facing and the record number of overdoses that we keep seeing. Um, we'll also be taking a, um, a bill that would ban deceptive or um, threatening police interrogation practices for children. Um, and a bill that I'll be introducing this year is around um, our civil rape shield laws. So currently, if you are in criminal court for a sexual assault, you cannot use the previous social history of the victim to mitigate what has happened, but that is still allowable in civil court. So this would align our civil laws with the criminal laws. Um, in government operations, we'll be taking a look at um, oversight of some of our county electeds, like sheriffs and state's attorneys. That will be that would have to be a constitutional amendment, which is a really lengthy process. Um, we'll also be looking at really exciting things like emergency services dispatch and government accountability. I served on the summer government accountability um, committee that has some recommendations to make government more equitable, accountable, and transparent. Um, and we'll also be taking a look at the nomination process for our judges. Um, a couple of other things outside of my committee that I'm looking at um, is a bill that's called a right to charge bill. It would uh, mandate electric vehicle infrastructure at multi-unit dwellings. Um, as a renter myself, I know how challenging it is to get access if you want to get an EV to, to charge your EV if you don't own your home. Um, I'm also looking at a bill that would um, disallow medical debt from being reported on your credit report, so that would no longer get in the way of doing things like buying a home or buying a car. I would certainly like to see us live in a society where we didn't understand what the words medical debt are, but this is sort of a harm reduction tool as we hopefully get there. Um, and then we will also be introducing an, a bill and likely working on parts of it in the Judiciary Committee um, that would 
dictate that the big um, fossil fuel producers like Exxon and Mobil um, are held responsible to pay for the damage their products have done. Um, and so those are a couple of the things that I know we will be working on, that um, I will be working on, and as, as um, Representative Chita said, I know there's more as well, but I am also really interested to hear from all of you. Hi everyone, I'm Jill Krowinski. I represent the Old North End in downtown Burlington, and I'm also serving as the Speaker of the House, which means I don't sit on a committee or uh, sponsor bills, but I have the great honor in helping to shepherd through the priorities that we all we all share and the values that we share and making sure that we're creating a Vermont that works for everyone and leaving no one behind. So I'm not I'm gonna be careful not to talk about things that have already been talked about. Obviously housing is going to be a huge priority for us this session. Last session we spent nearly invested in um, almost $300 million in different housing programs across the state. Uh, we invested millions of ARPA dollars to ensure that we're getting affordable housing units up in all 14 counties. And so we'll continue to uh, work on that because we know that is the core um, piece for so many um, challenges that we have in our state. It always comes back to housing, right? So we'll continue to do that. We're also going to continue our work on climate resiliency and flood recovery. I know in Burlington, we were, uh, many of us weren't impacted by the floods, but our dear Intervale Foundation was, and all of our local farmers um, had to go through a really difficult time. And so we've been looking at different ways to support our farmers to ensure that we have emergency funding available uh, when they need it to, to address the problem immediately. So. Uh, we're going to be looking at different ways to support our food systems as well um, to make sure that they're strong and resilient. In addition to that, we'll be looking at the renewable energy standard, and that's going to be another key part of uh, tackling climate in our state. Um, as we've heard, we'll be doing some work around health and public safety. We have a huge backlog in our court system and we are long overdue for making investments to make sure that they have the workforce to keep up with the pace um, and to ensure that we have enough judges on the bench to keep up. And so uh, we'll be doing some work around um, access to justice as well this session. Uh, workforce development is also a big issue in our state. Uh, for several years now, we've been investing in critical careers so people could go to Vermont State University and have access to programs that would allow them to uh, go tuition free or uh, have forgivable loans or grants. And those are in careers like nursing, plumbing, electrician and plumbing, all of these things that we need right now when we're looking at climate resiliency and building housing, right? And so, um, especially in healthcare with the cost of traveling nurses. And so, if we can help people become more interested in the profession, have access to education, we can help with address the, that issue. Um, also, uh, Tanya mentioned this, I can't stress in this how important accountability is going to be. Uh, we spend a lot of time investing mo uh, money in, in different programs and ensuring that we're meeting the needs of Vermonters, but in many cases there are programs that are not getting off the ground or the, the law is not being implemented by the administration and, and being implemented the way that it was intended to. And so uh, accountability is going to be another key piece of our legislative session. And um, one bill that's a favorite of mine, because I don't get to uh, sponsor bills, but that we're tracking is a right to repair law. Um, I was actually out um, logging the other day. It was so awesome. We were just, it was great to see these incredible uh, machines and talking with loggers about how it would just make such a difference for them to be access to repair there. So right to repair is my little favorite bill that we're gonna get across the finish line and looking forward to the conversation tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Um, uh, I'm Troy Hedrick uh, from Chittenden 15. Uh, so wards two and three intersect with that district. If you look between North Avenue and Pearl Street, um, east of North Winooski, there's a little square there of, of, the, of your districts. Um, so Brian and I um, share Chittenden 15. Um, I serve on the Corrections and Institutions Committee, so I'm gonna just start by talking about some of the things that I know are coming through that committee immediately. Uh, the first is just making sure we are shored up for funding all the repairs to state buildings that were damaged by the flood. Um, I, we had a, a briefing earlier in the fall 
Um, I have a lot of confidence in building and general services as they plan that repair, those repairs, and the chief recovery officer's ability to leverage uh, federal funding um, is right on, on spot, so uh, a lot to be optimistic there. Uh, we just received a very long uh, report from the Department of Corrections on the Women's Correctional Facility. I'm not all the way through it yet, um, but I do anticipate that we're going to be hearing from DOC on land acquisition and continued designs of those funding. Everything I'm talking about tonight is, I, I explain very deeper, as, including uh, my kind of philosophical approach to all of this, uh, in my blog. That's just troyhedrick.com. And you'll see a link to it on Front Porch Forum uh, momentarily. So uh, if you want more depth, and uh, you can do that. Uh, the Futures Caucus, uh, a group of legislators uh, who are under the age of 45, some millennials and Gen Zs, are bringing to our committee uh, a bill that will decrease the sentence for incarcerated individuals um, if they complete a degree. So I'm excited to see some of that. I am introducing three bills. I don't have numbers for them yet. The first is based on a California law. Uh, it's a bill that will provide protections to sexual assault survivors from weaponized defamation lawsuits. Um, if you want to talk to me in more detail about how that shows up, I'm more than happy to do that. Um, I see it constantly uh, in the university setting. I work uh, for UVM adjacent to the sexual misconduct uh, investigation process. Uh, so this is really important legislation and I'm excited to, to hopefully see that get going. Um, I am introducing a bill that would amend uh, current statutes so that it would require criminal cases against children under the age of 18 uh, to start in the family division. Um, this is in direct response to a 14-year-old child recently being charged as an adult after what appears to be an accidental shooting. Uh, I am working with a UVM student who wants to see an increase in access to naloxone, especially in downtown businesses. Um, so we're tweaking a standing order for the Vermont Department of Health. Um, uh, I am all, so this is a bill that, that Brian introduced last year. Um, it's H446, an act relating to the reconstitution of UVM Board of Trustees. I work in close alignment with the faculty union and the staff union, um, and we are trying to um, democratize the Board of Trustees by adding faculty and staff union. Uh, so I'm gonna be watching that very carefully. Um, and I will also be watching the Memorandum of Understanding that is currently being developed between UVM and the City of Burlington. Um, I have some pretty significant concerns and I've been very outspoken about um, uh, how UVM is currently partnering with the city. Um, I will seek to convince and remind my colleagues that UVM is a charter of the General Assembly and I think we have an obligation to hold them accountable when they're not showing up to the table. I'll leave it there for now. But again, my blog has deeper explanations on everything. Amazing, thank you all so much. So does anyone have any questions, thoughts? For this listening session? Hey, um, my name is Jacob Flanagan. And uh, first off, I would like to say thank you for passing Sorry, I don't know any of all the details, but the law to make it so that duplexes can be built across the state and municipalities can force that not to happen. Um, kind of on a similar vein, I'm in the solar world, and um, one thing I would, I've been talking with a few of you on, one thing I would love to have your help with is making development of renewable projects uh, work in the state. Right now, uh, hydro and wind is basically not possible because of our regulations and permitting policies and solar is getting harder um, mostly because of our administration's kind of efforts in that regard. So I uh, really appreciate uh, any focus because I see kind of a similar thing with housing as we as renewable energy. We, we, we made some decisions about housing many decades and, and now we're, we're paying the penalty and I think we're, we're running down a similar track with our renewable technology. Thank you. Jacob, I am happy to continue to talk with you about that. I am really um, interested in some reports that are coming back around land use in Act 250 that we'll be taking up this session. 
um, that will bring us back to some of these conversations and as well as the renewable energy standard. I know I said that before, but I do think that that is a critical uh, conversation for us to have and sort of the next place to go when looking at climate resiliency after passing the Global Warming Solutions Act and the Affordable Heat Act, which we need to make sure gets implemented and is strong <laughs> and happens. So uh, again, just happy to work with you and keep on talking. You guys can, anyone can respond to anything. Um, and also, if anyone else wants to talk, they can always raise, make this a community conversation. Yeah. I'll say something quickly that I wasn't going to, but I will. So, um, something that we were talking about in the last session, and it didn't, it, there was an amendment that was looked at, and this piece didn't make it into the regional planning report that was referred to by the speaker, I think, just now. Um, it was to look at how to, when we're looking at land use, look at how to co locate waste management and energy production into the development of new housing. And I haven't given up on the idea, but if we look at each region and we can look at ways of, of managing waste and generating energy as we develop, we it, it will reduce our carbon footprint. And one example, like in Burlington, we have the McNeil plant, which is controversial. Um, what if it, what if all of our compost went to the Intervale, into biodigesters? I'm not saying this is the solution, it's just a way to think. and. The, as that that uh, waste is decomposing, it could be it, it generates natural gas, which is what it's going to do in a landfill anyway. That natural gas was used locally to heat greenhouses to grow food year-round for the people of Burlington. Or what if the gas was burned to heat housing? So like I'm not saying that there's problems with that too, because energy is. Like, it's complicated. To live in this universe, we destroy things as, as sentient beings. So we're always going to do that, but in terms of harm reduction, if waste on the local level could be used to make energy on the local level, it's going to reduce the harm. So that's just an I think we need to be thinking creatively, um, and I want to give you an example of like one, one idea. So. Uh, could you quickly go over your accomplishments from last year, because my brain is a little fuzzy. There's a lot of vetoes and veto overrides and that before ping pong matching. It would be great to see your successes, failures, what you were going to do, change, go back and adjust to accommodate for somebody else's opinions. We could talk for hours about this. <laughs> This is not, there we go, okay. Um, one that I think, uh, yes, it went all the way through. It was a nail biter because the Senate had to act during the veto session to finish a bill. Uh, but it is S-103, don't ask me the act numbers, uh, but it is a bill that improved our wage discrimination, um, or wage, oh, sorry, workplace discrimination uh, laws. And in there was an update after 20 plus years of our equal pay law that added racial identity and gender, gender identity. So it used to be a law that said based on your sex, so it updated and modernized protections under our equal pay law. So now people, um, just, despite their identities, have two ways to do a, um, a wage-based claim or wage-based discrimination claim in their workplace. I have a quick one. So I'm on the healthcare committee, so I'll just focus on that. One of the greatest accomplishments of our committee was advocating for um, investments in pay for frontline healthcare workers across the board. Everything from community mental health, Home, um, home providers, um, dentists, nursing, because we have it, the pay has not been keeping up with inflation, and we have practices closing and people losing access to healthcare. So, unfortunately, though, how do we sustain that? And that leads to one of our greatest failures, which we are not taking enough action towards universal healthcare. And I'm hoping in the next session we are going to be forming a universal healthcare caucus to try to bring everyone together and re reignite that fight. More to come. Universal school meals, that was a big one. Um, I didn't know enough about it at the beginning of the session, but by the end of the session, it was just so obvious to me that, that, was, that that's the right way to go, and I was really happy to support that bill. So that was a win. Um, I, I kind of want to talk about oh, something that we didn't win, but I could maybe do that later. 
So I'm really proud of our child care bill that we passed, and I'm really disappointed that the governor vetoed it, but I'm really proud that we were able to override it because it's so critical. We hear from families all the time having to choose between their job and taking care of their kid at home, and that's not that doesn't reflect our values in our state. And so our bill um, made many investments, but one part of it was to ensure that we're paying workers more and that our early childhood educators have access um, to a more professional development and we're opening up more slots for families. And I'm so excited like we're starting to see um, more slots and more uh, daycare centers open up, child care centers open up across the state, which is so awesome and so needed. So one of the successes that we had in judiciary was um, to protect healthcare providers who are providing reproductive health care and protect people who are seeking access to reproductive health care in a post row world. We've worked really hard at the state level to make sure that people have access to the health care that they need when they need it and that they can't be extradited to other states or sued for accessing that care here. So that was a really huge success in in one of in my in the judiciary committee and i certainly also could talk about challenges but i don't know if this is the moment um i was last year was my first year and i will be completely transparent last year was my first year and i'm going to be completely transparent um i spent um, a lot of time just taking it all in and that's really hard to do um I'm going to talk about a general kind of surprise for me, and then I'll, I'll talk about a little bit of legislation and then something that I still need to figure out for myself. Um, here in Burlington, the partisan um, politics between the parties um, is significant right now. The, the, the gridlock is significant right now. I was really incredibly pleased to find that that's not necessarily the case in Montpelier. Um, sitting on a committee with Republicans and Democrats and myself as a progressive, um, I was really pleased to learn that we really can work together and push and pull with one another um, as we create legislation. That was a surprise to me, and I'm happy to be part of that. Um, I'm on the Corrections and Institutions Committee. It is not a sexy committee. Um, we are mostly moving around dollars that are bonded. Um, so <laughs> uh, I, I, I was pleased to learn about that. I was, uh, I'm still really confused about how the governor um, inserted money from the general fund into our capital bill. Um, I, I, I'm worried a little bit that I don't understand it, and if I don't understand it, how can I explain it to um, anybody who asked me why we're doing that? Um, uh, really pleased with uh, gun safety legislation that we passed last year that um, uh, requires safer storage. Um, and 72-hour 70, waiting period, yeah. Thank you, Speaker. Thanks. Um, I'm Lucy Gluck. I live in um, Ward 2 now, it is, around the corner. Um, thank you all for all your fantastic work. We appreciate that and see that you're all working hard. Um, I work for COTS Committee on Temporary Shelters, so I'm working with people who are struggling with many issues, and I won't get into all the layers, but the things that are rising to the top um, over and over and over again, besides trying to find a place to live, I mean, we're lucky enough in Burlington to have a lot of free food, a lot of jobs, so people who want to work can find a job and bring in money, which is awesome. Um, we have a community health center of Burlington, which is fantastic, and Safe Harbor is doing great, great work. But what people keep saying to me, and I'm trying to help them work through this, is they cannot find um, mental health for themselves as adults. Um, and or primary care physicians that they don't have to wait months and months for. So I don't know if it's what is going on behind, besides staffing and different things like that, but this is really, really hurting people a lot who already have so many um, different challenges and traumas to deal with. So those, you know, the, the just finding a counselor, not having to wait a year, you know, um, it was really sad when Howard Mental Health had to pull back on some of their programs, and that is impacting our clients hugely. Um, so not that, I know you, you've got your eyes on all of that, um, and this is not something that's gonna come on, you know, into your agenda right now, but we are, as you all are, because you live locally, still suffering with the F-35s overhead, and it is a health issue, and it is a trauma issue, and 
it's not going away and we're not forgetting about it. So I just want to name it. That's all. Thank you. Um, so I, when I'm not in the legislature, I am actually a clinical social worker, so I provide mental health care. Um, and one of the bills I was really proud of that was actually from my last biennium when I was in the House um, is looking at the workforce shortage. Um, and I believe the report back from that group to help us craft legislation for innovative ways to make more investment in the mental health field is due back, I believe, uh, this month. And so that would allow us to really look at how, how we work on that and bring people into that field. You know, it's a, it's a field we've underinvested in for 50 years. There isn't going to be an easy fix, um, but certainly it is on my mind all the time, knowing that it is the work that I do in my day job and, and knowing the many barriers to getting into that work. And I mean, I have a wait list that people sit on for a year, so I, I get it. I know it's really, really bad. And I'm hoping we stood up a, a group of, of people from all kinds of different places of life to really look at how we grow and diversify that workforce. I'm, I'm also a licensed clinical social worker, so I feel, and I'm on the healthcare committee, so I feel obliged to say something about this um, from lived experience as well as like being a legislator. That the healthcare system is like the rest of our economy, it's extractive. So healthcare workers like myself, Tanya, and others in the room have worked in a system of care that has not properly supported us in supporting clients in terms of our wages, our benefits. I can't afford to use the health insurance that I have to purchase. That's like That seems inhumane, and I'm not the only one. And we keep raising the rates, but retention is still an issue because the, the, acuity, the acuity of the work, as you know, doing the work is getting so high that it's traumatizing us, like the workers. So some of the things I think we, we can do to address this, one is uh, the Racial Justice Alliance wrote a bill that passed that created the Health Equity Advisory Commission, and, they, and the commission has recommendations on provider training, and what's cool is they recommended that the training be not just for traditional healthcare workers, but for anyone who contacts people in the system, including policymakers. And so hopefully our healthcare committee will be looking at ways to roll out these recommendations, and I'm suggesting we start with corrections, because that's where we see some of the greatest disparities right now, and we have corrections workers like handling tra traumatic things in facilities that people shouldn't be there. They should be getting treatment, not locked in a cage. And so um, that's one thing. And then the other is peer support, that for years we've been fighting for peer certification in Vermont so that people with lived experience can do the work of, of um, supporting people um, who have similar experiences through, through trouble. We have Turning Point as an example, or Pathways Vermont doing great work in this area. We have to build on that. And you know, what if we provided workforce training for people struggling now so that they could learn to be the healthcare workers helping others out of those struggles down the road? And so we're gonna be looking more at peer support services, at, at micro-residential, at programs run by peers. So I just thought I'd share that because I think those are two solutions that may help, but ultimately we have to stop treating the healthcare system as an extractive thing, and we need to be thinking regeneratively, and also about like making sure healthcare is a human right. That's right. Turning point is doing a great job. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Real great support for people. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have any comments? We have seven minutes left, so we still have room for a comment or two. I see a hand. Oh, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Creed. I uh, live on um, North Avenue in the Old North End. Um, I had a question about um, the drug crisis, like fentanyl coming in from other states into Vermont and what uh, is being done to address um, the drug trade from other states coming into Vermont. Thanks. So I think that that's a conversation that is going to be had in the State House to really try to figure out how we respond to that in a way that is actually helpful and grounded in public health. Um, but I don't know that there is a single solution that has been put forward yet, but I am certain and I know having talked to my chair on judiciary that, that, that those are conversations that we're going to be having. Um, but I don't know that we've landed yet on a solution. You know, I think a lot of times the knee-jerk response is to increase 
criminal penalties for that type of drug trafficking, and what we know from history is that is rarely effective. Um, it fills our jails and prisons, um, and causes people to rely more on children to do that trafficking because they're less likely to be charged in the same way, and it causes them to use different adulterants that aren't yet criminalized that we don't know how to respond to. So that heavy criminal response often is sort of like playing a game of whack-a-mole with the next thing that is, is going to be killing people. And so I think it's really about an on-the-ground public health response and making sure that we have places like overdose prevention centers, ready access to treatment, um, I mean, I, you know, some countries have responded going as far as like a safe supply where people can get access to whatever it is they're using. I don't think we're there in the United States. Uh, but I think what we can do is, you know, one thing we did last year that I was really excited about was passed um, immunity for um, infrared drug checking machines. So people can go and get whatever substance they're using checked to know what is in it so that they can use it more safely. And we passed a law saying that, they, that no one can be arrested for operating or utilizing those sites. So I think that a lot of the response needs to be in keeping people alive and getting them access to services rather than heavy criminal responses that really are just gonna shift us into some other really dangerous um, thing that we don't know how to respond to. Like xylazine has made more of a an appearance in our drug supply and Narcan doesn't reverse silencing overdoses. And so when we force people to go to the thing that we haven't criminalized yet, we often are then playing catch up and trying to keep people alive. So I think it's really about looking at what are the harm reduction supports and services that help keep people alive. Yeah, I agree. I would say that the first bill I think we will see on the House floor is a harm reduction bill that made it to appropriations and didn't quite make it to the floor that has pilots for overdose prevention sites and we hope to fast track that bill and get it to the governor because I do think it is critically important that the public health perspective be the, the lead on how we um, manage this crisis. The one thing I will add is if people are needing to direct people to drug checking, Vermont Cares has a machine that is mobile um, and I know that they're going to be in the coming days and weeks doing some sort of pop-up harm reduction going to the places where use is happening to make sure that people have access to drug checking narcan wound care um, sterile supplies um, and also doing some street cleanup so i think to just make sure you know that also, there are syringes on the ground, and so I think this is going to take a whole community response to respond to this crisis, and Vermont Cares right now is doing some of that work. If you know people that are using that want to use more safely. Thank you. Does anyone else have any comments, questions? Hi, my name is Tess Bradish. I live here in the Old North End. Um, Senator Ruchina talked a little bit about uh, housing, and I was just wanting to um, ask how uh, rent capping comes into play and if that's being considered in affordable housing because inflation has been a massive issue and uh, there are definitely many greedy landlords in this town. So. It's, it's a topic that is sensitive for people, and I'll give you one example of a possible way to do it. So, because just capping it may not make sense, but like what if, this is kind of complicated, but I, I think it's sometimes good to give people a detailed example. Like what if there was a formula that was used to determine what is truly affordable in a region? Because right now, I don't believe the way that we're, the formula we're doing it is really what's affordable um, for most of us. So we figure it out, and we say to people renting property, if you charge within like $100 above or below that amount, you get taxed normal. You know, you're staying in like in the lane. If you creep above that threshold, you start getting taxed. And the higher you go, the more you get taxed until you hit a point that all your profit is going back to the state to be used for affordable housing. So it's, it's capitalism, it's the free market. Like they can choose how much they want to give back to the state. And if people want to keep it, if they want to just pay their regular taxes, and guess what? If you go lower than the threshold, than the bottom part, you get a tax break. But there also has to be a limit on that because we need taxes to fund the state. So maybe if you go below a certain point, you stop getting the tax break. So let's say, um, I'm, I don't think this is fair, but let's say it's a thousand, the bedroom is considered affordable. I think that's the rate now, I don't think that's affordable, but let's say that's affordable. 
you charge 1100 a bedroom or 900 you, between that range, you would get taxed the same. If you charge 100 above, 1200 a bedroom, you get taxed more, 1300 more. When you get to 14, you're giving all of your profit back to the state. And likewise, if you go below, you get a break to a certain point. I think that's one example of maybe a way we could stabilize rent without capping it. But I think we need to be thinking, how do we create incentives and um, penalties, or carrots and sticks, as they say in the legislature, um, to try to steer human behavior in a way that is making housing affordable, because housing should be a human right and not a commodity that's bought and sold, in my opinion. I, I just wanted to say, if you don't speak up tonight, you can always email any of us. I know I speak for my colleagues here. Please reach out. I, I, was, I made a newbie mistake this year. I ended up getting too caught up with my constituents, and I, I, had, like, I have like 11 bills, which is way more than I ever envisioned I would. But I had constituents reach out to me, and I said, you know what? That's a great idea. Let's work on a bill for that. So don't hesitate. Uh, I know we're here to represent you in any way we can. So. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thank you all for coming. Uh, we're now going to move into our next section, which um, right, I'm, I'm Brian Pine. I'm the director of the Community and Economic Development Office, also known as CEDO. And among the duties that we have, one of them is to um, address our housing challenges, support a um, strong environment downtown, um, and uh, we are looking to uh, potential, exploring the potential, I should say, for a public-private partnership where the city's um, involvement with a private entity that I'll describe in a little bit would um, look at the feasibility over the next few months uh, of whether a uh, redevelopment of the Memorial Auditorium and the parking lot, basically all of the land on that side of Main Street from Union to South Whiskey Avenue may include something to do with a relocation potentially of the Central Fire Station, but that's not determined, that's to be fully reviewed. And so basically we're in this period which is in real estate, sometimes called due diligence, which really just means look carefully at all the assumptions and all the potential hurdles and all the issues. Is there a project, is there a feasible project that could be developed here? So that's, that's what we're here, I'm here to discuss tonight. I did this same, similar presentation, not same, um, last night at the Board of MPA. So I'll try and go through these slides fairly quickly and is gonna help me, I'll just say next. So, here we go. All right, we have technology on our side tonight. So just to you know, get ourselves centered here, the city on this particular block owns the property labeled Memorial Auditorium, the fire station, the, and the parking lot below what's called the fire station that is named at the bottom of the gateway block, um, the library, and the parking lot to the what would be the <coughs> excuse me the east of the library, which is um, between the library and the church. Um, the purple, I Janet. Think, I, I was, if people are in trouble getting what you're saying, that's great. If there was a lost item, because you know, I'm not supposed to have to read the labels, or if I, my brain doesn't work that way, I, I just want to find out if people are really understand. If I'm the one who's, you know, the caboose, that's fine. But if everybody's lost, I want you to have them with you. Sure. So are we talking about lost on geography? Is that what we're talking about, or on the whole topic? Oh. oh, okay. So I don't have a pointer, so I can't really do much. But I'm going to go up on stage, and I'm, this says auditorium right on it, right here. This says fire station, gateway block and parking lot, Fletcher Free Library. Okay, I think First Congo, maybe some some congregational church here. So that's what we're looking at. This shaded area right here is privately owned by, um, well, it's just privately owned. So our challenge has been <clears throat> to look at a, at a way to come up with a comprehensive plan, but that includes that purple area rather than tries to sort of hopscotch over it to include the parking lot. 
And so I should just point out that underneath this parking lot running kind of like this, diagonally from here, right through here, is a massive ravine. Yes. It's the ravine sewer, and it's, it's 20 to 25 feet down. It's a huge ravine that is, um, nothing can really be built of size. There was once a county jail where the parking lot is, right here on the corner of Maine and South Minuski, but that was a two-story structure. It wasn't a very large structure. Uh, it had a house for the sheriff and, his, and their family, and that's what that was before. But in order to really get it so that it can be something, um, a more significant building in our downtown as part of the gateway, um, that so that ravine sewer is being relocated. It will it will now basically go down College Street to Winooski Avenue, down Main Street to Church Street, and then flow where the where the um, where the pipes go now. So that's what's going to happen in order to make that site manageable for something to happen. And when I say something to happen, there's been different visions over the last three three or four decades. There was a public safety proposal in the early 90s to build a police and fire station on the parking lot. Um, that did not pass, or did not get enough votes to pass. Um, when we look back to Memorial Auditorium, and people say, well, it's, it, we should figure out how to save it, and we have tried numerous times to get voter approval to make investments. I did find a ballot question that failed in 1994 was going to take care of most of the issues, and it was a million dollars. That was the cost in 1994. Today, sadly, the estimates we have range from 30 to about 40 million to fix up Memorial Auditorium. So, our challenge as a city is we only have so much ability to borrow money in order to keep our taxes, you know, reasonable, but also to maintain what's the what they call the bond rating. So if a city our size goes past a certain level of debt, borrowed money, the agencies that care about how much debt you carry um, re reduce your credit rating. And when your credit rating goes down, your interest rates go up. And so it's actually quite significant an issue for a city like Burlington. So we have a high school. And the new high school is about $160 million. That's the bond amount. It could be more. And there may be some additional grant funds to lower that a little bit, but that's about what it is. That kind of uses up all that bond capacity, that debt capacity for the city for quite a while, at least seven years, maybe more. So what we're faced with is a building which for decades has largely been, shall you say, they call it deferred maintenance or just neglected. And that's why Memorial Auditorium is a um, building which is in extremely difficult very challenging conditions at Memorial. So what we're trying to look at is what can be saved and what can be repurposed, if you will. And the ideas that, we're, that are being explored now is um, housing somewhere on this site, a couple hundred housing units perhaps is what's in the letter of intent. A mix of incomes, um, super energy efficient because of the current energy code, um, all electric because of the prohibition on new fossil fuel buildings. Um, as little parking as we can possibly get away with, but a recognition that this site may be also a good place for folks who come to town with their vehicles can, can get a space in a, in a public facility that would be sort of on the inner portion, most likely, of this, of this block, sort of somewhere in here that would then allow for things like the library and maybe the church to free up this space for perhaps other programming and green space and put our parking sort of buried in here is, is one of the ideas that's part of the letter of intent. So these are all concepts. None of this is like a plan. This is, a, this is all purely conceptual at this point. Um, next slide. Sometimes I get stuck on a slide that my coworker told me, don't get stuck on a slide so long. Sorry about that. Um, this is really just another view of it. So um, we could probably move on. <laughs> all right. Um, so this is just a bit of history on Memorial. It was built around 1928. Uh, it was built as a memorial to the returning veterans from the First World War. Um, it has served you know, a number of purposes. I have very fond memories of 
with the youth employment program in the 80s, creating the first Burlington children's space at the very ground level. We renovated it and turned it into a child care that the city launched because there wasn't enough child care and the, the mayor said we need more child care. So um, my kid, my first, our oldest kid went to daycare in that space and then my kids were in rock camp here and they played basketball here. And so I think most people who've lived in Burlington have some connection to Memorial. And usually it's quite fun, I think. So um, it really is a gem. Um, I really hope that we can find a way to repurpose it and save as much of it as possible. Um, I don't know that it will be possible to salvage, but what we have um, are multiple attempts to try to reinvest, to try to stabilize um, Memorial. And what we do have right now is um, we have some funds that have been used to ensure that the building, what's left, and the condition it's in, not be allowed to deteriorate further. And so repairs have been made to the roof and the whole roof structure and roof system so that um, you know, so that the weather doesn't um, penetrate the building and cause any further damage. Um, it does need an entire heating system um, overhaul, and that would be extremely expensive. And so that's on hold. And so right now, the building is largely um, dormant and it's mothballed. That means all the water has been drained out. It's you know, it's not heated. It's not, if, it, if there's no risk of of um, you know pipes bursting because everything's been drained in the building. And so that's where it is right now. Um, Next slide. Um, again, there's some <coughs> previous proposals for redevelopment, um, both of the whole, well, of the parking lot. There was talk about a decade ago for the YMCA to relocate to Memorial. In addition, at the time, there was an idea that some mixed housing, both student housing and just community housing would occur. Because of that purple lot that I pointed to earlier, that funny shaped lot that's privately owned, um, that never came to fruition because it's, you have to kind of get that Third, that private entity to, um, to come along, and that, that was a challenge, and has continued to be a challenge. Um, there was a proposal for UVM to have an arena there. Um, higher Ground looked at locating here before they decided to, to go to, to Burton. Um, and um, even for a little while, the high school um, team that was looking at where to put the high school looked at this site as a possible location. We finally got a proposal that looked like it had um, some real potential, and it was an immersive art facility, which maybe somebody else can describe, because I'm not exactly sure what immersive art means, but I think there's one in Montreal, and there's one in um, um, maybe Austin, Texas. The Meow Wolf is, um, it's a very unique experience. It was really exciting. It looked like it would blend art and, um, and public access, and it was just, it was incredibly exciting. It didn't get, um, uh, they couldn't make it work. They just couldn't figure out how to make it work. So they spent a little while doing that due diligence and they couldn't make that work. Next slide. Um, try to put this in the context of some of the planning efforts that this community has had around things like Plan BTV and kind of, you know, creating a little more of, a, um, of an urban fabric downtown to ensure that we have really walkable, um, pedestrian-oriented um, downtown with, with you know, plenty of housing, plenty of uh, places for folks to get their, um, you know, get their daily needs met, but also um, places of employment, um, really to ensure that the downtown has um, you know, the, the right support for, um, for that type of sort of dense urban development in our downtown. And so that is a guiding document that has led to the sort of thinking of the gateway block. Next slide. Um, this is a, both a photo on the left of the current, uh, actually it's not current because it has the uh, Midtown Motel. That's been gone for a few years. So this is, you know, probably maybe just before the pandemic. Um, and then the pictures on the right depict um, some of the drawings that came out of BT, uh, Plan BTV. Um, and I'll point to what it is. Um, this is, um, <clears throat> as you can see, that's the church that we saw earlier. The fire station is right here, so the idea is this is this is Main Street, this is Winooski Avenue. I know Representative Chena's office may be somewhere down this block here. Except like it's two stories. I know it may have an extra story added above you. Yeah, he's looking at it like that's not my building, but it is my building. I can see his face. Um, so these are concepts. These are not like plans per se. These are concepts that were part of the plan B T V. Next slide. Um, so what now and, and what are we trying to do for both 
um, memorial and for the whole block as an opportunity to really you know, bolster our housing supply and to really address the ongoing challenge of what to do with memorial. Um, we are um, you know, facing some really exciting work that will happen on Main Street as far as the Great Streets project, um, which if you don't know much about, take a look at DPW's site to describe what the Great Streets project um, involves, but it's you know, a major sort of generational investment in the infrastructure from um, from Newski Avenue. Uh, it has actually changed a little bit. It was originally going to be from Union Street all the way down Main Street to the very bottom. Uh, because of funding constraints and cost increases, the Main Street project is being kind of squeezed a little bit, shrunk a little bit, um, and it will be a shorter distance on Main Street. But the idea is to extend those, those improvements, the great streets, which really has a real pedestrian and bicycle focus with a dedicated um, bike lane on the street. Uh, so it's got some really uh, great features. And to extend that <clears throat> right up Main Street um, past Memorial Auditorium. Uh, so I think, OK, next slide. We want to just give you know, a reminder that this public process that it was engaged during 2018 um, you know, identified things the community really wanted to see happen in Memorial when we were hoping it could be repurposed really as a public it's kind of community gathering space entirely. Um, and so these were some of the priorities that we just want to continue to highlight and you know, make sure we don't forget that these were priorities. Um, there is a real commitment to look at community space by these, these particular individuals and the letter of intent and they actually call out youth-led programming space. So they're very specific that they want that to be included. Um, these are obvious things, attractive welcoming to our downtown, that's why it's often referred to, we like to refer to it as a gateway. Um, mixed income housing, I think we can all agree, huge need for housing at, at most income levels. Um, preservation of the veterans' memorials, which if you haven't been in the building, there's great big plaques that, you know, name the Burlington folks, Burlington residents who, who were, um, who gave their lives in World War I. So it's a, it's a commemorative piece, there's, there's several of them. Actually, I think some were discovered uh, about 10 years ago when we were brought out of like a basement and were restored, so that was, that was really exciting. So, um, a public space um, with, a, with a real focus on use again here, um, some type of public parking, don't know how much. Uh, obviously, growing the grant list is important as a downtown site to do that, to, so the rest of us taxpayers don't um, um, can share the burden, if you will. There's the benefits and there's the burdens, and growing the grant list is what that's about. Um, and obviously, long-term economic benefit for having that vibrancy in the core of our downtown. Next slide. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, the ravine sewer has been a real barrier to, to development um, on that lot, uh, as well as some other lots like the old hood plant, which is um, where, where King Street goes way down and then comes back up. Um, it'll, it'll address those properties as well. Um, we haven't been able to control that property that I referred to earlier, that pinkish property that privately held, we call it the hole in the donut. Now, not a great one because it's not a circle, but it, it kind of works <laughs> as a visual um, image. Uh, we have this big bond capacity issue, which I've touched on already, and the cost of, of renovating Memorial now approaching the, the 40 million mark for it to be a feasible project. Yeah, next slide. So we are dealing with the Great the Ravine now. Um, we obviously have an acute housing crisis. We need to be exploring every possible place where housing um, makes sense, and this is a site that certainly makes sense. It's on a main corridor. Uh, it's very accessible to um, our, our transportation system. It's, it's, a, you know, it's a great location for, for people to live. Um, and um, just advancing the goals that the community has around um, you know, having a thriving, healthy, vibrant downtown, uh, pedestrian oriented and um, and those goals as well so next slide um, two local developers control that pink chunk of land and that's eric farrell and joe larkin eric farrell is um, did uh, originally did development as well not originally but maybe 15 years ago in the new north end um, near um, uh, stanford road as well as um, Thayer School, which used to be DMV in Burlington out on North Avenue, that whole development, that was Eric's, one of his um, flagship developments. 
He also led the development downtown, which has TD Bank, it's still there on the corner, but the rest of the site was, was a development that Eric did when he was with Redstone. And more recently, Eric is a developer of the property that used to be known as the Burlington College or the St. Joseph's Orphanage on North Avenue, now called Cambrian Rise. Um, Joe Larkin is um, second or third generation um, person from a sort of real estate uh, background, and, and his largely his um, area of expertise is hotels. So the concept here is that Eric will focus on the memorial redevelopment, repurposing with housing as his main focus, and Joe Larkin um, brings a, um, a hotel as his. That's at least his interest in that. So that's that is part of the concept here. Um, next slide. Again, the letter of intent has been signed, which gives until the end of March to explore um, all of these aspects of due diligence, the feasibility of whether there is uh, a project here, whether there's a way to make this viable, whether it's feasible. Um, this is part of the public process that the city council asked our office to engage in, and um, so we're, we're doing that now. Next slide. We're running out of time? Okay. All right, so we're at the last slide, that's perfect. Okay, so here's the time frame. We are now, of course, uh, over there in December. So, we'll open it right up. Brian? Chris. Thank you for that. Um, thanks, Chris Stats, to hear she. Um, so, the big property that's privately owned, was there ever, I don't know if I missed it, any discussion of just outright buying it so that that was not a, I mean, uh, a possibility of just developing the whole thing? Uh, as a one unit. I think there's a desire on the part of both the current owner. So the current owner isn't Farrell and Larkin. The current owner is another group. Okay. And they okay. they desire, they want to be either a developer or they want to do a deal with these guys. So that's... Okay. So yeah. they will not do a deal with the city. They okay. Yeah. Secondly, and, and I assume that the um, we own the church? Or no, no, congregational church. Yeah. No, no, that's privately. Okay, church, church, church owns that. Yep. Of the yep. That were, were, um, yeah, they broke um, through on the driveway though. They used to the driveway used to end, and they they, they cut through now um, to go through the memorial to Main yes. Street. They didn't used to do that. And okay. They are interested in kind of a redevelopment that would move their parking off of that site and to the center of the lot, as we talked about, okay. potential garage. That's something. Both the church and the library are very interested. I mean, the church has basically a parking need um, one or two days a week, really. Yeah. Okay. And then, and then, lastly, I assume that um, just like the memorial, I would love to see it maintained in some way or form, just like you, many, many years of um, it's a community, uh, sadly used community resource at this point, um, and also the Carnegie Library. I'm assuming that's going to stay. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and lastly, Roger and I were saying we should free the sewer. Just let it go. <laughs> you know, I'll take that under advisement. No. What do they say? Yeah. <laughs>
in the ideal world, how many units can we put up? I think they have broadly the concept of, of at least a couple hundred, but I think that's like a placeholder number. Could be more, could be less. I'm just curious about the fire station and what would happen to it if it was part of the development. So the fire station is a, is a good topic for us to talk a little bit because I think it was 2018, maybe 2017, the city had a study to look at the fire stations and it gets rather complicated. It gets into things like the firefighters wanting to have at least three firefighters on each vehicle because of new standards around response and safety and what you do when you go out and do a fight a fire, but also when you deal with other emergencies. In order to do that, it gets really challenging with our existing stations. And so, I'll forget, I think we have five. We have one in the New North End, we have one in the Old North End, we have one up near UVM, Central, and then we have South End, so five. The one at the very far South End is so far south that it really isn't that useful, honestly, because of the geography and the center of geographic sort of center of gravity of where the activity is, it would, the idea would be to move the central fire station from there, very difficult by the way for them to get in and out of there during an emergency, so they try their best to get out really fast, but they will say that their time, response time getting out of central is never as good as their response time in other locations. So the study found that the best location for where the call volume was, at least five years ago, was probably about where I'm just going to say this, not to take over their property, but Curtis Lumber, that's about where the fire station geographically should be, and the one on Flint Ave, or not Flint, um, Ferguson Ave, Ferguson Ave, that's it, should not be in Ferguson Ave, basically. That's, the, that's what the study concluded. And so, there's no foregone conclusion, but the building itself is absolutely good enough shape that it would have, and it pretty much has to be, preserve the fire station itself, because of the, it's in good shape, relatively good shape. I can't see any scenario where that would come down at all. I really don't think that would ever pass. Yeah. Do you look at taking down the auditorium, Brian? Or I mean, that's on the table for sure. Yeah. I, I, mean, I think it's it's their goal is to figure out how to use it as best as possible. Whether it just gets redesigned into their project, you know, when you think of the building that has the um, comedy club in it called the Armory downtown, yeah. that's an example of reusing a building but keeping you know, as much as possible. Brian. Jacob. Hey, so <laughs> do you re know, remember what the timeline is for doing all that review work? So what, So, basically what I'm getting at is, what's the earliest that something could actually happen on this yeah. project? That timeline that we have there doesn't quite do it, but that is, um, this is executing a development agreement in January of 25, so that's a year from now, what roughly, is no actual construction takes place in that time period. So construction would have to be after that. Um, if all goes well, construction on Main Street, the ravine, will be done um, in 24, that part of the project. So that's about, gives us about until 25 before anything could happen if this is deemed feasible. A lot of big questions to be answered between now and then, but um, these these local people want to be. I think they want to. They want to be part of resolving this for the community that they grew up in. So I think they're both really. They seem really interested in this being kind of family legacy type project. Are they? Were there were three guys who were coming in to save BHS as well. It's not the same group of people. Was it? Um, uh, the pit. Oh, the pit. Never mind the pit. So many people said. Oh no no. no. No, that's uh, that's a different group. Okay. Yep, different group. Uh, there's a lot of priorities. Uh, you have like civic space, music, youth uh, life groups, housing, parking. Like, is there a like hierarchy of which ones you're gonna or? Maybe not you, but the developers want to focus on? That's a really great question. There used to be a game called uh, Sim City, and you could do like this thing. If you like this kind of stuff, it was really fun. You could take those variables and decide what was going to win out and what was going to go. But no, this is probably going to be, um, a, I think it's viewed as an opportunity to really actually hit on all of those priorities, honestly. 
That's the, that's the wish. And I can tell you there's, there's um, one counselor here tonight, but the council has been very clear that the priority is to figure out how to preserve as much memorial as possible and also not to sell off the city land as an asset, but to use it as a way to kind of leverage public benefit and keep it in perpetuity as city resource. So that's been guiding us. We probably have enough time for one or two more questions. Anyone? Are we too close to each other? Is that it's the speaker up here. Oh, it is that? Yes, it might get in front of it. Yep. Hi, I'm Roger the Hood. Roger, what's that? Did you? The Hood Tower. Is that one of the priorities? That you see that? Is the hotel priority? Is the hotel that, in the list of the priorities yeah. for development, you can see that. A hotel is, is definitely a priority for the private partners right now. Um, I'll, I'll be blunt about it. Hotels generally are ways to make the housing a little more um, financially viable. So even though we know rents are incredibly high, they often don't, um, you know, the banks don't like the way they look on a budget, on a pro forma, if you project them over time, because costs keep going up and rents aren't projected to go up quite as fast. And so they like, hotels are viewed as a good way to kind of shore up the development. So that's, I think, what they're hoping to do is use that as a, Burlington hotels apparently have the highest occupancy Rate, which is like saying the lowest vacancy um, of hotels in northern New England. So, um, yeah. Do we need another hotel? I don't actually know if we need another hotel. Largely, that's where the public and the private part comes in. If they determine that a hotel is what they need to make it work and we get housing and other public benefits, that's the trade off I think we're looking at.
So with respect to public involvement in this process, right now we are um, trying to gather some public input and feedback through bringing our um, bringing this to neighborhood planning assemblies. Uh, there will be there will be additional opportunities. Um, we don't envision any action occurring for quite some time. We have this due diligence period until the end of March, and at that point, I think it will be time for the council to discuss and debate a development agreement, and a development agreement will often spell out things like um, role of, of public input, public involvement beyond the normal process, which is, you know, go through the planning, or sorry, the development review process and, and all of that. So, um, but as far as like, um, the question about use of, of city land and, and those issues, it'll largely be um, a process where the council, you know, considers public input in that in that decision, basically. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Thank you so much. So now to round out our meeting, we're going to hear from both city and school counselors, or from their councils. <laughs> oh my, I'm one. I'm the only guy yeah. here. I have 20 minutes. I, you know, I said five minutes was not enough. What shorter? So I decided because I only had five minutes, which I now don't, but that um, I was gonna just say, hey, what do you wanna ask? And then I'll I'll answer it. And let me just say the only thing that's coming up on Monday night, which is the last meeting until January 12th, so it's the last meeting of the year, is going to be a discussion about a MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, with the University of Vermont around housing. I have been very clear that I won't support the striping of any lines, let alone anything else at UVM, until they seriously deal with the housing crisis that is caused in much part by the under housing of their students. And so whether this MOU um, does that, we will see. The document, the, the, the council's agenda was posted today and the MOU says items to be posted or materials to be posted later. Lovely. But um, what we um, have made clear um, and what is implicit in the item on the agenda on Monday is that um, we are not making a decision. We need the public to weigh in, to hear what this deal is, and then to decide uh, what y'all should be telling us. Is this enough? And really, the, let me end this part by saying it's been my perspective that the University of Vermont has refused and does not believe that housing really is something that they should be, you know, providing. It's like not their mission. And they've had that position for as long as I know, which is like the early 1970s. They have a housing crisis which is now affecting them. People are having a hard time going to the university because they can't find housing, they're getting tripled up. It's just a mess. So this is when they come to the table. And the question will be, like what we saw here um, with Memorial, how will we negotiate these things? Negotiations are give and takes. So you can't get everything you want, otherwise it's not a negotiation, it's a holdup. But um, we'll see on that. And so everybody should be paying attention to this because the housing of UVM students is critically important. I know that everybody in our wards and, uh, and in my neighborhood, Wendy's neighborhood, the student underhoused population is you know, coming into the community, and I love students in the neighborhood, but it is not um, a responsible way for them to be operating, which is just basically increasing enrollment, increasing enrollment, increasing enrollment, and not housing their people. So, um, and we need, when I say we, the city councilors, 
need you to be there to help us have a hard life. We, we don't have, it, you know, because everybody else is saying like, oh, we have no leverage, right? You know, they give up before they have the, before they have the fight. Okay, so that was a really long, I'm sorry, uh, way of talking about one, one thing that I wasn't going to talk about hardly at all. Questions, and Wendy says stop. But I never listened to her for the last 35, 40 years, so what the heck. Lucy Gluck has a question. Yeah, Dean, if we, if we can't come Mondays or some other way we should get input, is this the beginning of a long process, or what are the steps here that we're looking at? If you can't come Monday and you can comment on public comment, like on Zoom, but I think that the, the question that you should, the, the statement you, that would be helpful is to say, do not railroad this. I, we need the opportunity to see this. Um, it, you know, so coming back, is it, is it too short a period of time for us to, to actually vote in it on January 12th? It's a long period of time. You got holidays in between we wouldn't have had really a debate. We're not gonna have a debate on Monday night. What we're gonna have is a presentation. We're gonna get talked to and we're gonna ask questions. And then we're gonna have to figure out, you know, the give and take of that. And you all are sort of like an afterthought in the brainiacs of the world. We <laughs> so there are two meetings in, uh, in January and one in early uh, February. If you, if there is the desire and the need for vigorous public input, then communicating to us via Zoom or in person or in email that would get sent to everybody to say, you know what, thank you. We'd love to do this. We we're gonna digest the material. Uh, we need some more time and actually uh, January 12th is even too soon, right? That, that's totally legitimate. If people don't say that kind of stuff, then the march just, it just this, the tide, the currents just keep carrying it off. So, um, so that, that's the way that I would, I would do that. Comment in person uh, via uh, the uh, uh, the Zoom or by email that would get sent to the whole city council and ask that that be included on our consent agenda. So we've got that. Mas. Thank you. Any, I other, mas. any other questions? No. No. It's okay. Uh, the, let me just end. Some of you have. Uh, uh, I'm going to run for election. This is not a, an election pitch just to say that uh, I've got some petitions that my dear heart uh, circulated uh, for me earlier while I was at other meetings uh, and anybody who hasn't signed who is in the newly constituted Ward 2, I tried very hard to keep Ward 3 folks in Ward 3, I failed miserably and did, did not get the votes. But, um, please uh, Sign my petition is in the back there when he's got this right here. Thanks. Amazing, thank you so much. Okay. Um. Thank you, Michelle. We have to do our drawing.